to everybody. This session will be available for everybody after uh, maybe a day or two after the session is there and it'll be on the Design for Aging BSA website. Uh, this session is also a AIA accredited session for 1.5 LSW. And I have a link that I will put in the chat, please. Um, if you are a registered architect or you would like a certificate that you've attended this, just fill in this form and let us know. And the BSA will do that for, for all of us. We'll file directly with the BSA and provide the letter. Um, okay. So Bruce Hayden from Human Studio was introduced to us through Sandra Harris. And uh, when Sandra brought to us an article and sent us an email to introduce us, uh, Bruce, your topic was very unusual for what we do at the Design for Aging, but at the same time, very relevant. It is, it is a platform that um, many of us are curious about. We, when you and I had lunch maybe four weeks ago, we talked about how a good amount of us have intuition of what is a space that gives social connectivity, but having the data that compares space A to space B is hugely important. And um, <clears throat> uh, what we, we all are curious here, and I think myself included, is how can we really take this, this seems to be a innovative software for social interaction and really apply it to our daily work, whether we are doing work outside of the building or inside buildings, whether we're doing in master planning or we're studying some interior renovations, the software that you're about to show us uh, can do multiple things. Um, a little bit on Bruce. I'll introduce you and then you can have the floor. So Bruce is a past passionate about human engagement as a central objective of design, both for social health and for fostering creative entrepreneurialism. He's currently leading the enhancement and validation of the Fluid, F-L-U-I-D capital, sociability software tool. This work is at the core of Human Studios work on enhancing sociability through evidence-based design. While the Fluid software tool focuses on building design, Bruce is also co-author of the book, Urban Magnets, which I have here, thank you very much, how activity substructure can be a catalyst for rejuvenating cities. The focus of this work is that visible human passionate activity can be a catalyst for urban vitality. Both Fluid, Sociability, and Urban Magnets are expressions of Bruce's curiosity about the link between human connection and the built environment. Uh, with this, I turn it to you. Thank you, Philippe. Um, it's uh, it's it's. Uh, I'm grateful. I, I imagine it's a lovely summer night in Boston, so uh, we're still in kind of mid afternoon here in Vancouver. Um, I, what I'll do, it's a small group, so one of the things that I'll do in, during this process, I'll maybe leave that. The, keep see if I can keep an eye on the chat. So if I uh, um, use an expression that's a that's an obvious Canadianism that that uh, the Americans don't uh, don't get, then you can you can just say what the heck is that or something like that, and I'll see if I can answer. Um, the uh, I and I would say actually I, I'm not um, um, I'm not particularly familiar with the kind of issue of seniors housing in the United States context, or even to some extent in the Canadian context. Um, so there, it's entirely possible I'll use completely the wrong terminology. So apologies in advance for that. Um, I also will say I have a slight resentment against Massachusetts in general because I was at a lovely wedding in Nantucket and I was dancing too hard and I broke my foot. So my association in Massachusetts right now is a sore foot, which is not your individual problem, but that's um, that's what's going on for me. You so can blame this on the state, but it's okay. <laughs> we'll give it. Uh, and just to double check, Philippe, so we have until, um, uh, sorry, 3.45 my time. Is that right? So yes. Okay, perfect. So Thank you. Our time till 6.45, we wanna leave a time, unless yeah. uh, your session is interactive and we don't need questions, then we can roll over till the end, but no, it's, there's it's all gonna yours. be. I, I anticipate that the, the, I always find that for these presentations, that the, the, um, um, the question and answer is actually the most fun. So what we're going to do is, is I'll, I'll do, I'll, I'll give you the kind of background of, of fluid sociability, uh, the kind of how and, and why, why we, we started doing this work. 
and how we think it's uh, that, that it has potential to be valuable. We'll do a little bit of a demo and then we'll, well, actually we'll, we'll talk about fluid in general and then in terms of uh, some of the potential applications for specifically in our, in our view for, for long-term care homes, but certainly for seniors housing in general. Um, and then we'll do a little bit of a demo and there'll be a chance for a Q&A. So uh, let me go into a share screen and then we'll, there we go. All right. Now you should all be seeing a blue slide. Is that, can someone just give me a thumbs up? Perfect, thank you, okay. Um, so what I'm gonna do is uh, tell you a little bit about this. So we, we fluid so sociability is a, uh, a simulation tool. And um, one of the things that I always like to do is to thank our amazing um, American funders, the Robert Bruce Johnson Foundation, who were, have been really critical to this work. And Robert Bruce Johnson is one of the largest private funders of um, public health initiatives in, in the world, actually, and they've been really extraordinary partners in this. Um, there is, and I'll put, it, put this in the chat later during the Q&A, there's a couple of links to find more about this. We have things like an introductory video, but uh, let's figure out whether you're interested first before I give you the links. So most of you, if you're here, you'll understand um, the value of, of social connection in general. But what I would say is our experience is that this is a real hot topic in part because of the pandemic where social isolation was obviously ramped up. But I think really in terms of um, general societal resilience, it's a really important question. We know very clearly that social isolation um, um, is, a, is extraordinary challenges. I also would say that I'm kind of modest to some extent about architecture's role in this. Um, but one of our collaborators, Dr. Liz Dunn of, of University of British Columbia, who's got amazing TED Talks out there, is really clear that the, you know, solving social isolation is not, there isn't like a single thing that will work everywhere. There's a, a small bits and pieces. And I am a believer that design is one of those bits and pieces, absolutely. We know that social connection can increase happiness, improve mental health, and improve physical health. These are all known facts. We also know that social isolation can lower life expectancy. One of our favorite um, quotes is from Juliana Holt Lundstadt, who does a lot of research in this. And social isolation is approximately equivalent to smoking about 20 cigarettes a day in terms of your in terms of the negative health effect. We also know that social isolation, particularly for the aged, is actually has a, a increased risk, risk of dementia. And this is actually a, a relatively recent study, although the, the indications around this have been, uh, have been going on for quite a long time. So it's a real issue. It's not a nice to have in our view, it's essential. Now, we, um, when we were looking, started to look at this topic a number of years ago, we recognized that from the sociability perspective, there really were only three or four different, different things that, um, supported architects and designers making better choices. Uh, one was precedent studies, and I'm referencing, uh, there's, a, there's a local group in Vancouver called Hey Neighbor, which was sponsored by the city, where, for example, they just went out and, and looked at a bunch of buildings that were considered by their own tenants to be sociable and looked at things like, what are the amenities they have? What are the, what are the kind of social connection um, pieces that they did? And they did this amazing work, by the way, of actually um, funding very nominal amounts, sort of mostly recent immigrants who are living in buildings to actually act as social catalysts. There's work um, that we call kind of visual and analytic site-specific monitoring. So for example, the historic and current project for public spaces videos, just looking at people in the public realm, not so much inside buildings. And there's in-situ experimentation, um, Happy City, which is, a, which is a, an amazing group also based here, has done a lot of work with things like strapping heart monitors on, on to understand how your body physiologically reacts to different ur urban environments. What there isn't so far is a, a tool that we can start to understand how buildings affect sociability from a predictive perspective. So how do we make design better? So we're very passionate about all of, the, all of those types of tools that we that I talked about on the last slide. But what we're trying to do is to really understand um, you, what we call simulated social data and the term of art is agent-based modeling. This is part of a kind of a core passion for us. And as I say, we've got a kind of urban um, model for it that uh, um, Philippe mentioned called Urban Magnets. As a, as a, as a point of um, if a piece of professional advice, don't release a book about socialization in public realm literally three weeks before a pandemic shutdown, it's a bad idea. 
Um, but you can still buy the book. So, and then fluid sociability is, is corridor work. This came about, um, this work came about, I used to be a partner at one of the largest architecture practices in Canada, a firm called Dialogue. We had a whole ton of staff. And while I was there, um, I led the design of a branch library with um, uh, a social housing for women above. In many cases, it was women and children fleeing, some cases fleeing violence, not always, so it's long-term housing. And we knew that sociability was actually gonna be really critical for this. We did a whole series of versions of the design. So essentially we have a concrete box with the, which contains the library and, uh, and, and housing above. So things like a, 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 an upper level courtyard, and uh, it's a mid-block site. So this is essentially the version that we, we ended up doing and ended up being a little bit slightly different, which you all recognize as a double loaded corridor scheme with a strip of units facing the main street and a strip of units in this case facing south. The challenge in this case, especially in terms of the relationship between say indoor or outdoor spaces is we knew that this is gonna be terrible from a sociability perspective. Not terrible, let's just call it ordinary. Um, and we did a different version, a kind of stacked townhouse version where um, you know, two level units all looking into a courtyard, all in, in our case, we have beautiful views of the mountains. You get some view of the mountains, but you get some south light during the day. But you would also step out of all of these units, well, roughly 70% of them, and you would see about, um, sorry, you, you'd, stuff, you'd step out of any of these units, you'd see the front doors of about 70% of your neighbors. So we knew that this was gonna be dramatically better just from a basic level of sociability. Um, and the challenge was that it had a slightly higher percentage of exterior wall area. And what we found is that in design, as we all know, that hard metrics almost always trump soft metrics. And I was just really tired of losing these kind of battles because I knew, especially for this kind of vulnerable population that, that but I would say for all of us that we, we, could, we could do better than we were doing and we needed tools to do it better. So what we've developed, we got initial seed funding from British Columbia Housing, BC Housing, which is our, our social housing agency that has a research arm. What Fluid is, it's a web-based, agent-based modeling software tool that allows quantitative sociability comparisons of different options while buildings are in the early design stages. The idea of different options is really important because what we recognized in doing a lot of work in this is that we know sociability is not straightforward. There's all sorts of cultural issues associated with it. There's different sociability in Vancouver is going to be different than Boston, than Portugal, all of these sorts of things. What we wanted to do, so this is why we always talk about comparative analysis for, rather than absolute analysis. We're not saying this is what will happen if you build this building. We're saying given this set of assumptions, um, we know that scheme A is going to be better than scheme B. We have a whole series of really amazing partners in this. Um, we, uh, UBC Psychology is our re research partner. We'll talk a tiny bit more about that. BC Housing, um, the city of Calgary has, has jumped on board to really work, work on social housing projects. Uh, Robert Johnson, we mentioned a whole series of fabulously patient testers that were with us in the early stages of the software when it simply didn't work at all and it would just crash. Uh, we've got a couple of lovely collaborators in Australia and a couple in Denmark. Um, I always love to give a shout out to Dr. Elizabeth Dunn. Um, if, you, uh, if you get nothing else, else out of this talk, go and watch um, um, uh, some of her TED Talks. Um, she's just a really, uh, in, she's been an amazing coach for us and a really great guide about the broader issue of sociability. And one of the things that she always talks about for this kind of modeling tool is the critical importance or the critical issue that it's not important that it's accurate, it's important that it's useful. And that's been a really good guiding point for us. Um, we've done a ton of ton of homework. What we've recognized, though, is that that very interestingly, and and this is something that that uh, um, Liz has really recognized for for her team and her work as well, is that there's a huge gap in the knowledge of what I call the physicality of sociability. So for example, um, we asked and we said, we, you know, we, I'll talk a little bit more about how the tool works, but we asked, okay, if I'm, if, um, let's say Philippe and I live in the same building and we're walking towards each other along a corridor, what's the likely distance that we're gonna say hi to each other? And they actually said that they had no idea. There's this real huge and interesting gaps about, about this basic issue of what are the physical stage setting elements that support social connection. So we had to invent some. Um, 
fluid sociability starts with residential buildings, um, but it actually is designed that the uh, the underlying engine of the tool is designed to be used for for any type of building. We have to build what we call use cases and different population assumptions. Um, but the engine is designed to be flexible. It currently focuses exclusively on the interior buildings for a couple of reasons that I'll tell you about. Um, mostly having to do with scale and complexity of when you have very large numbers of social interactions. We've built a spatial categorization tool that's fundamentally a Revit tagging tool is one way to think about it. Out of that and out of assumptions about population that are generated automatically, there's a series of root finding algorithms that just kind of say if I'm an uh, one of our characters is just an externally employed adult. So there's an assumption I'm going to move in and out of my building X number of times over the course of a day. And then we measure three things with different degrees of confidence. In fact, a diminishing degree of confidence. We measure first what we call um, encounters. And encounters is very simple as, as we are, the way we, we refer to this is it's the physical opportunity for social interaction. So in simple terms, leaving aside the moment when you might be able to hear each other but not see each other, if you can't see someone else, you can't actually say hi to them. Um, and then we measure the next level, greetings, exactly what it sounds, and then we measure conversations. So we built a structure for this. What I would say is that we have, uh, that as we get to the right-hand side of the screen we're, we're screen, we're in much more in speculative territory. And we still are, we, we're still, I should also note that we're really, I would say at the beta stage of this, we have a working tool. It's out there available. You could start using it in your offices tomorrow. Um, but we're also going through a very detailed um, um, validation process to make sure that we're actually getting good information, um, which we're, we're, we're confident we're getting, we're getting some useful material. We're not confident yet, well, all of it is, is useful enough that we wanna use it to make design decisions. So we measure, as I mentioned, these three things, encounters, greetings, and conversations. The reason we don't just measure encounters, which is the thing that we have a high degree of confidence about, and again, remember that encounters is just that physical opportunity for a social connection, is it's not known that those are inherently valuable as a public or a private good. I, and one of the ways I think about this is the transit station problem. If I'm on a subway station, and there's a thousand people around me, I have lots of opportunities for social interaction, but I don't usually do it. And so simply the volume of, of, of opportunity for social interaction is not inherently a good thing. What we do know from a, from a research perspective is that greetings, the simple act of saying hi to the person who makes the morning coffee for you is actually good for you and good for them, interestingly. We know conversations are good as well. We have generated, as I mentioned, this kind of tagging system. Um, and I won't spend a lot of time on this diagram because it's easier when you go to it. But we really don't, we don't measure, for example, the social interactions within what we, the suite. So we don't measure inside an apartment. Part of the way I think about it is whether you like your spouse and your kids or not is really up to you. Um, um, but we also know that in that kind of, that kind of intensely intimate relationship is that social interaction is fundamentally a different game. And, uh, and so that's, um, uh, that's not something we're, we're looking at. We do measure it. So we break, the, break a building down into the following categories. And this is principally for the sake of generating the movement of the digital occupants of the building. First of all, the suite, very simple. It's the private space of the building. Circulation as we define it for the sake of the tool is not any public areas of the building. It's actually those areas of the building that are needed to for ordinary pathfinding, for want of a better word. In some ways, it's like analogous to if you have a uh, um, a corridor of a certain width. You know, you need so so much distance for two people to walk side by side, and there's surplus distance outside outside it. So um, I'll probably start using metric metric dimensions because that tends to be what we use here. Though we tend to be comfortable with feet. Um, so this circulates, so we can measure, one of the most useful things the tool does actually is even just start to trace circulation paths and intensity. Um, what we, the spaces that of the building are public, excuse me a second, I mean, one of those, one of those spaces where it's, uh, uh, I have to stand up and wave my arms to turn the light back on. Mm -hmm. Otherwise I'd look very kind of, you know, film noir-y. Um, the, uh, uh, Pause, what we define as pause spaces, spaces that are in the public realm of the building, but access to basic circulation needs. So I can imagine a wide corridor with a niche outside it that would allow you to step up and have a conversation. 
then we have two types of destination. We call well, the first one is mandatory destination. So this would be some things. These are things, again, remembering that these are the things that generate the movements of the digital occupants of the building. So uh, it could be a, uh, the lobby, garbage spaces, um, uh, those sorts of things. So these kind of things that you know you need to do over the course of a day or over the course of a week. And then we have optional destinations, which are those things like amenity rooms that are not required for you to go to. And of course, this would be different in different building types, um, exactly which, which one of those are optional. But they're, they're the, um, one of the reasons we do this is often in an early stage of the building, we don't know where the amenities are going to go. But we do want to start to understand what the effect of the basic building circulation is on sociability. And then we measure semi-private space. Um, so we measure, we, we use semi-private space again to understand sociability. So this is decks, balconies, the kind of front porch. So that's the, that's the kind of where we measure, then what affects the, um, the, the movement of our digital occupants? So these are, these are some factors, not all of them, but familiarity is one, for example. So if I have a standard route that I go every day from my front door to the lobby of the building, I'm going to tend to continue to use that route um, with some degree of, uh, of confidence. And the best way to imagine this is we're, we're, as our agents move around the buildings, as our digital occupants move around, we're just constantly rolling dice about choice points and the dice are weighted based on different things. But let's imagine, say for example, that I won't go through every one of these, but let's say, say that we're in a courtyard building and it's raining. I'm gonna take a slightly longer route to get to, to, so as to not have to walk through the rain than I would normally. Whereas if it's a beautiful sunny day, I might, uh, I might take, a, take a route across the courtyard even if it is a bit longer. So these are some of the things that, that affect agent movement. And of course stairs, and this is especially important with elderly population, um, the stair probability is important to how frequently we use stairs relative to elevators. And again, there's astonishingly little actual hard data on some of these things. So if you look at the, these for a moment, these are all physical. And by the way, one of the things fluid sociability does is it does allow you to, to, um, uh, to use local, local weather data. So you can actually get, obviously, again, a, um, a courtyard condition in Calgary is going to be very, very different than a courtyard condition in Miami. Um, what affects the likelihood of greeting someone? So the most important thing here is familiarity. So the, our digital occupants have memories. So again, to use an example, if Philippe and I live on the same floor, the same building, and we, we see each other um, uh, seven or eight times over the course of the week, we have a much more higher likelihood of saying hi than if we are, live on 10 floors apart and never see each other. What exactly those percentages are, we don't know. We know, for example, that we have a higher likelihood of if we're moving towards each other to say hi than if, we're, if one person is moving sideways or perpendicular to you. Um, we've introduced what we call a caution factor. Our digital occupants don't have genders, they don't have ages, but they do have different degrees of caution, which is a way of just understanding that some people will say will be more or less comfortable going up and down a remote stairway or more or less comfortable crossing a courtyard at night. Again, it's a kind of randomization factor. We don't think it's perfect, but it introduces variance in that thing, which we think is important from a modeling perspective. And then we know that dogs and kids are tend to be actual social connectors. Everybody just said you have to model those. I'm not going to go through a ton of this slide. Um, you can see a degree of complexity. So if the First thing measuring encounters fundamentally was physical. The second thing was fundamentally social and about the ages having memories. Conversations we, we, we know not too much about and we have a long list of different things. We can make again some educated guesses. We know you're more likely to have a conversation when you're coming home from work and you're not feeling under time pressure rather than if you're leaving for work. So we know a couple of those things. We know that you're more likely if you were actually in a place that you control to engage in a conversation with someone else. Um, we know you're less likely to engage in conversation if it's raining. One of the examples that I always use that, that I find fascinating, for example, is, is that we actually have no idea. We did quite a lot of digging in this. If anybody has any links, please tell us whether you're more or less likely to have a conversation in natural light, which seems to us a, would be a lovely thing to be able to, to know um, in terms of, and quite easily easy to test. We just haven't got around to that one yet. So this is the fluid workflow. You start with a, with a Revit model. Again, it's designed to be, so the early stage Revit model has to be a clean model. 
um, not a perfect model, but a clean model, because it does, if, you, if the mo input, input model is a problem, it's a challenge. Then there's the marking up process. So for example, um, we will do, if you have a typical multi-unit residential building and you have a two bedroom unit, it will assume for the sake of our initial use case that, that there are X number of people living in there. And the way it knows that is that you tag the door as a two bedroom entry. So to some extent, it doesn't matter what's behind that door. You just know that's a, a generation point for the agents. My son, if he was talking about gaming technology, we call it a spawn point. You then export that model to the Fluid website. You run the simulation based on the parameters and you get results. So what we're gonna do is talk a little bit about how, how it's been used so far and a couple of examples. And again, we've got some lovely partners and people have been helping us. So this is a, um, a case study for a project called Rundle Manor, which was actually uh, the city of Calgary. And the city of Calgary is kind of under always under pressure. Um, Alberta is sort of the Texas of Canada. Um, they're always under pressure to uh, to reduce public expenditures and make sure, you know, why not just give the money to the private sector? So they always want to um, um, demonstrate in their social housing projects that they're doing better. On the left-hand side was an existing post-war social housing project that was pretty terrible. On the right-hand side is exactly the same site as the replacement. The first one's been demolished. The second one hasn't been built yet. This is the output of fluid, and I'll, I'll go through the couple of a couple of different examples, but you can kind of see this is the plan of the new proposed one. But rather than lingering on this, I'll go to a couple of other examples. So you can see in, in this existing housing, and this is a case where we we did I did say that it's mostly used for the insides of buildings. We can do this kind of um, smaller scale site analysis where you don't. And in this case, it was actually. Um, one of the things that made this possible possible is that it actually wasn't a particularly walkable neighborhood. Almost everybody would arrive and depart from this by car, which from our perspective made it a little easy, easier to game the modeling. But you can see there's an existing housing and a proposed redevelopment. We were also able to correct for um, the fact that the, the one on the right-hand side had um, more units, because obviously you don't want to just say, oh, it's more sociable just because there are more people. That would be a false, a false positive, as we would say in the COVID world. Here you can see the purple is just indicating um, the paths of travel. And, and this is an interesting, interesting fact, as you can see. Can everybody see my, uh, uh, see my cursor? Okay. So what we've got here, these are just the, you can see that you essentially have two pods of housing that are actually only very lightly interconnected in terms of day-to-day -day travel. And, and on the right-hand side, you can start to see how the different degrees of social connection are just actually generated in part by more paths. So one of the things, leaving aside any interest in social connection, you know, one of the things that we always, we always talk about is that, that if, you, if you're going to do an interesting, a good place to sit, you know, you put it here in this plan and here in this plan simply because it's on the normal course of pathways. And one of the ways I think about fluid is many of us, we, we could probably think a lot of this out ourselves with a piece of trace paper and some some markers what we found is that people tend to believe it more when it comes out of a computer to be transparent we also know that we've surprised ourselves and i'll, talk, I'll give you a couple of examples of that what you're seeing here is the yellow is what we call an encounter as i mentioned earlier and the green is greetings now we use the term lasers and the reason for that is if you think about again this issue of the physical physicalization of sociability if I'm walking towards another person and we have an opportunity to say hi to each other, uh, where does that opportunity occur from a mapping perspective? We use the term laser because we recognize we couldn't just assume it was halfway between the two people for a couple of reasons. What if I'm walking by and there's someone on a balcony up above me and I'm looking up, then the actual encounter point is going to be somewhere in midair, which is not helpful. Um, so we do, do these lasers, but what you can see is that this one, it does have um, you know, there's certainly a density of different en encounters and greetings on this side, and this one is more distributed, but you can start to see that there's a much higher frequency in this point. There's a kind of an interesting hotspot um, uh, in this one. And this is and what we also use. This is a really critical parameter for us. This is what we call encounters per resident per day. So this is the very simple thing, which we have, I would say, again, always being cautious that we're not measuring reality. We have some confidence that this is a useful and interesting one. So if I'm living here, just picking up my groceries, going to drop off my kids at school, whatever, I'm going to see a fellow resident less than once a day, 0.74.
If I'm living here, that number is almost four times as high. So that it, for us is a really interesting one. And, and the, the value of that from a city of Calgary perspective was enormous because yeah. they were able to actually start to understand that indeed what they were doing was building better housing from just that particular lens. This is another case study for us where we actually were doing a, um, uh, we're doing an infill infill project in in a, for a <clears throat> site for the Royal Canadian Legion. There's a bunch of uh, old old uh, Canadian Legion sites that are kind of old post war buildings being redeveloped. And we did two options, and this was just a, just one with, on the left hand side was was one of those kind of challenging infill ones where you have smaller scale buildings desperately trying to look uh, smaller scale apartment buildings desperately trying to look like single family houses. Some of you probably dealt with this particular challenge. And then the right-hand side was a more kind of landscape-based scheme. And in this case, you could see that we were, again, that the, the original scheme here, which wasn't our favorite, was actually about um, neither one of these were particularly, uh, particularly highly social, and which is an interesting one. And one of the things we're developing is, is really a kind of a series of, of um, issues, A, to test the modeling, make sure we understand to whether we're, we're getting things right. But the other thing we're curious about is what are the fundamentals, uh, fundamental aspects of building design that are really baked in? So for example, our modeling tends to show, and many of you will be probably unsurprised at this, that, that high-rise buildings are orders of magnitude worse in almost all circumstances than, uh, than, than lower-rise buildings in terms of social interaction, which I have to say is not a, not a result we're necessarily entirely pleased with because we do quite a lot of high-rise buildings. Um, one of the important considerations is this, this issue that we're really working a lot on right now, which is low sociability versus high sociability environments. And this came about because one of our first test cases that we ran, we looked at student residences. And what we recognized very quickly, first of all, the model almost always broke, broke down because it's fairly heavy in terms of its computing power, because we're actually looking at how our digital occupants, you know, what, what are they doing it at, at very frequently in terms of the timeline. So it tends to be quite um, computing heavy. And uh, the student residences almost always broke, broke, the, uh, broke the engine for a while. We've now kind of fixed that at a certain scale. But what we recognized, and I go back to the, our example of the, the kind of the transit station problem, is that there is a place beyond which sociability is not useful. And so uh, we, we, when we ran models of student residences where you, there are things, and I know this is a compare with certain types of retirement homes or what we call long-term care homes, where when you have like shared dining rooms, um, you very quickly reach a kind of saturation point of sociability in, in some circumstances. And we wanna get better at really understanding that. What we've done now is we built it in so our occupants have memories about, so if they will, they will have a kind of a, a memory card slot in their brain that occupies the seven people. And then if, if, they, if you meet, if they, the digital occupant meets someone else that they know well, because they've run into them a bunch before in a simulation, then one of the previous people who they don't know well will kind of drop in. And so we're starting to try to understand, because we think this is a very, very important one, is what's a critical, like, for example, if you're doing a very large building, how many entries should you have? Um, which we think is a really, would be really, really interesting to know from a sociability perspective. We don't know enough about that. So this is where I want to give a little bit of a caveat to some of the things I'm going to show you next. Uh, next. So um, we have been part of a task force. We presented a couple of times to the task force. One of the things that I'm sure happened in the United States and happened in Canada certainly was the whole issue of long-term care home regulation um, became very important uh, in terms of the health risk um, and how and how were they were managed because there were some real tragedies that occurred. So there's groups looking at long-term care homes for all sorts of possibilities and all sorts of issues, including sociability. So one of the things that came up from this conversation that was interesting to us was we had started to have a conversation with people that were dealing with, say, dementia. And one of the points that they made, which is obvious when they said it, but it hadn't really been on our radar previously, was that different degrees of dementia um, can have quite different, or different types of dementia associated with different personalities can actually have quite different desires for social interaction. So my mother, for example, who's 96 and, and is in care and has almost no, no short-term memory left, um, uh, I would say I kind of put her in the middle range. She's actually quite a shy woman, but she wouldn't want to step out of her room and be immediately in a bustling dining room. She would be much healthier with a little bit of a space, but we, she wouldn't want to be at the end of the corridor with no social contact. 
So one of the things that we can actually understand through, through fluid a little bit is, are there, say, for example, units in a project that are very, very highly social inherently, i.e. you're much more likely to step out of your door and see a lot of people versus units that are very low in sociability. Again, many of you with, with intelligence and awareness of this building type would be able to map it really clearly, but the degree is often interesting and, and uh, interesting for us to understand. So this, for example, we generate a bunch of data and we're actually testing different ways to visualize this data. These are uh, agent encounter diagrams. And they start to, to be able to explore grouping. So to how, and this is just, just as you move through the building, are there people that you see repeatedly? Are there units which actually have no social connection whatsoever? You know, they're right next to the right next to the rear door, and it's really easy for them to dodge out and get to their car. Those sorts of things. So we can start to understand this in different ways. We've looked a couple of times. We ran some tests just on different long-term care homes. This is a, a, a courtyard layout and a bar layout. And what you can see in the courtyard layout, and this is just, a, again, an interesting and obvious one, is that the, remember the yellow are encounters of relatively large scale projects, so it's hard to see. You can see that, that social interaction is certainly a little bit hotter over on this side of the building, but quite evenly distributed around the rest of it. Again, fairly obviously, because you have that situation of a courtyard where you have a choice of routes. And what you can see the bar layout is that you've got, again, hotspots around here, but more um, diminishing more towards the end. Again, intuitively, absolutely correct. It's the degree that's interesting. So this is like the, uh, um, and, and this is just some of the, some of the different analysis about how we've started to think about these. And the routing is, uh, is of course, useful and interesting. And so some of this, of course, is just this, uh, um, you know, what happens if you introduce a different access point? How does it change it? One of the precedents for this work, as far as we know, nobody has done exactly what we're trying to do, but some of you may be familiar with the, with the space syntax model in England. And the space syntax model uses a, a, a very, very smart um, kind of um, cellular analysis that it isn't based on movement at all. It's just based on interconnectivity between spaces. And this is analogous to some of that work. So one of our one of our goals really is that we we just it's actually really straightforward for us in some senses is that we know that the architecture is not a um, a, a perfect tool, um, but we do want to use our work to have so that people have more friends. It's actually really straightforward. Um, so what I'm going to do now is is I'll uh, I'll drop out. I think we're, we've got lots of lots of time. I'll drop out. Then I'll just do a super quick demo of a single project, just so you get a sense of how the software works. And so let me stop share, and then I'm gonna to need to go into Chrome for a second. So one of the projects that we were uh, we were involved with is that we presented to a group um, uh, that was doing a design for what there was a technical advisory committee for a project in Vancouver called Vienna House, which is a collaboration with the city of Vancouver or city of Vienna, where they were doing a Vancouver house in Vienna and Vienna and Vancouver was doing a Vienna house in Vancouver. And they're trying to learn lessons about social housing models. So we presented to them and we immediately got a call. It's a, you know, um, Vancouver and Vancouver is a, a town that's smaller than Boston. So we, all the architects didn't know each other. We immediately got a call from the architects who were acquaintance of ours and said, we'd love to use this model because we have exactly the problem that I described that was an inspiration to this work is that we, they had a courtyard scheme and a double loaded corridor scheme but they had no way of measuring what the difference between those two was in sociability. And then kind of what I think of as the embedded cost factor for the courtyard scheme were about 5% higher. So I'm gonna go share screen. Okay. Now you should be able to see a... So what you can see here is you can see the, the, the baseline model and then let's just kind of um, um, play with a couple of things. So you can turn the, it's designed to be quite simple in terms of you can, you can turn on and off different types of the space tagging, tagging categories. You can, um, uh, let's just go. So 
a shortcut to this one, but I always forget it. And then let's just turn on a single level. because so, so this is just a single level of the building. And then we can start to do different data visualizations on that. So let's just turn on encounters. You can see that. Turn on greetings and conversations. So you start to see, and as I, if you roll in, oh, you can start to see how that kind of the, the what I think of as the network of social interaction is here, is here. And then what we do as well is let's look at this number here, which is this 0 0.7 encounters per agent to, per day, which is actually an interesting number. It's not super, super high, which we we anticipated this would be would be uh, um, would be higher. And then let's go to the courtyard version. Now, this courtyard version, you can see, it's a, essentially a single a single loaded loop that was rolling around. And we'll do the same thing where we. Let's turn off all the floors, but let's go to level three. Actually, let's go to level five. So it's a typical, typical level. And again, you can just set floor level. I'm sorry. Turn on the suites. You can understand. And this is also a way when you're testing a model, because often sometimes the, the model does a good job of, of making assumptions about what suites are, but it's not perfect. And sometimes you need to test it. So you can see again, circulation patterns. This is the primary circulation. And let's go to, to data visualization. So what you can immediately see in this floor is that there's a relative to the other one, there's a higher density of possible social interactions across the courtyard, kind of coming from the, from the main vertical circulation space here and dropping off more over here. And this is actually very interesting because you can start to see as well in this one, what happens when you get the multiple levels, you have the opportunity of kind of saying hi to someone. So intuitively you immediately get that this is going to be more socially interactive. And indeed you can see this number is approximately 50% higher than the number on the double loaded corridor scheme. So that means again, in simple terms, you're moving around the building, you're more than 50% more likely to, to have the opportunity to say hi to, hi to a neighbor. And this is, uh, and that was interesting. One reason I'm proud of this is the first time fluid is actually used to make a decision. When when BC Housing or BC Housing um, had the uh, had the opportunity to to see this, what they did was they were able to to support going to the courtyard scheme, which we were we were very proud of. And then the last the last little story I'll I'll, I'll tell, and then I'll move it over to questions. Is 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 um, this process? Uh, we we tested one. We're doing a small indigenous housing project, about 35 townhouse units. We ran an A version and a B version. We knew B intuitively was going to be, if you push me really hard, I'd say twice as good as A. When we ran the modeling, it turned out, and this is again just how we organized the site, primarily how you access parking, it was more than 10 times better, um, which was a really interesting one for us because it kind of punctured our arrogance a little bit about this and our assumption that we would be able to do, know everything about it. And that was again, a, that made an easy decision about which kind of plan organization we were going with. So with that, I'll, I'll say thank you and open it to questions. Great, thank you, Bruce. Uh, I have a question. At some point, uh, I'll start. If everybody's okay, I'll start by asking a question. At one of the first slides, you had five elements of how to measure or um, encounters, the mm -hmm. stairs, and two other ones, and three other ones at the top of the slide. Yeah. I am curious how you came to about to determine this, because if we are to talk about, when you say stair for senior housing, it is not usually an element of anything. It's right, either exactly. an egress that is used for staff, or mm -hmm. sometimes there is a monumental stair in an independent living, but it, has, it gets really little use. For so sure. I'm wondering, and I'm curious to see here, what could be the substitutes of this element if we are to adapt the, this well, this model or software to senior housing? Yes. So, so the the diagram is the diagram is yeah, that you so is is intensely a little bit simplified. Yeah. So we know that, for example, a, a senior seniors complex would the, the stair stair use would be very low. Yeah. The way we would handle that would be simply that what we would do is that we would create when we haven't done this we've talked about doing we haven't got there yet is to build a build a what we call a use case for senior housing 
And essentially what it would say is we would assume that none of the residents would ever use the stairs mm -hmm. in simple terms. Because remember, stairs are simply uh, an aspect of the root finding algorithms, right? Correct. So in normal multi-unit residential, am I going to go up two flights of stairs rather than wait for an elevator? Maybe. So it really is about changing the route path. If we're designing a, a module for seniors housing, we would simply say nobody's going to use the stairs ever, except for staff, because you might also choose to to understand how your staff moves around the building. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And what would they be replaced with in terms of main roads of, of circulation or nodes of um, wayfinding? Well, they would simply be replaced with, with elevators or assuming in certain cases you'd have ramps, but we would largely treat ramps. Um, actually, actually is, ramps are an interesting case study. I'll, I'll delve into that. I, I, too, too detailed a conversation yeah. for the moment, but, uh, but essentially you'd replace it with elevators. So we're not okay. saying that yeah. buildings with yeah. stairs don't have elevators, just to be clear. Yeah. It yeah. was really trying to, that diagram was really trying to say, um, we know that the choice of whether to use stairs versus elevators is one of the things that affects movement. We should yeah. actually it's probably could do a graphic tweak to make that a little bit clearer. Sure, sure. Thank you. I have a silly question. <clears throat> um, in one of your your diagrams, you had a you called it a bar outline, which is basically a, a V-shaped building, and you approached it from the outside of that V and went into a lobby, and then you had corridors down on both directions. Mm -hmm. um, if you were to swap that around so that the entrance was on the inside of the V, it theoretically it's the same, but it feels different. Have you ever tested that? Somehow it seems like it's funneling you into the building and it's flowing you out of the building that way with enclosures on both sides. I wondered if that would make a difference. It, it, it might well, to be honest, we haven't tested that one. I have a question. Um, it regards the destination points. Um, you talked about the mandatory uh, destinations that people would go to and then uh, sort of amenity or not mandatory destinations. Right. And is there any assumption in the model that people, um, if they go to a, a amenity destination, would be more sociable than people who uh, go to a mandatory destination? Uh, that, um, uh, that's a great question. Uh, the simplest answer to that is no. <laughs> um, but what we, what the way we manage that difference is that we assume that. Uh, a an optional destination, let's call it a many room, is stickier, i.e., people mm -hmm. will spend more time there, right? Um, so that uh, you know, uh, as opposed to a, a, a transitory point. So the opportunity to kind of stage a set for social connection, we don't assume that people are friendlier in that context than in, let's say, a um, the the garbage room. But it's a very, it's actually an interesting question. I haven't heard it framed quite that way before. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. I think more about that one. I mean, have you discovered that in any way, shape, or form that that people are more likely to interact in any of these environments apart from just passing each other in a corridor? Um. Well. Um, so first of all, we're we're doing we're doing a, a series of different pieces of research. Um, but what what's what's interesting for us is so what, what we can do is we can dial up and down some of our assumptions to see how the assumptions affect the overall uh, overall modeling and see what happens. So we're doing a kind of what we call think of as internal sensitivity testing. And you know, we we may, for example, think that if this particular factor is really important to social connection. But when we model it in a bunch of ways, it doesn't actually change the modeling at all. Um, that doesn't mean it's necessarily inherently unimportant. It may just mean that our model is telling us that, that is something, something that's not quite right. But what one of our, I would say it's a very preliminary finding, but in simple terms, what we've found is that the critical thing, again, leaving any, any aside any issues of whether you like the next door neighbor or not, the critical thing that simply supports more social interactions having the possibility of occurring has nothing to do with the amenities whatsoever. 
it actually is tied in, sorry, this, and I'm just going to use the, is the example of just the, just the kind of conventional, conventional multi-unit residential building. So I'm not going to talk about much more social spaces for a moment, is actually the length of the visible path. So if you have one of the reasons we believe, and it's only an opinion right now, that high-rise buildings, for example, are a little bit less social. I think, buddy, you have a, mm. you know, you have a lobby, you have an elevator, and we know not much social interaction occurs in an elevator, and you typically mm. have a private corridor. So the length of your path from the front door of your building to your unit is has very low visibility to other residences. And when we've kind of turned off different, different factors, we found that that's actually the thing that really makes the difference, surprisingly, um, as opposed to amenity rooms, which anecdotally, what we know, for example, I and mean, we all like to think that we go to the gym every morning, but you know they tend to be more used for marketing than for, um, um, than for inhabitation. Now, again, this is, this is preliminary work, and I don't want to overstate that with certainty, but it's an interesting comment. Let me just wave and see if I can get a little more light. There we go. <laughs> Yeah, just a follow up on that, Bruce. Thank you for the remarkable work. Um, I mean, it seems like, like you say, there's what we think, who we think we are, and who we actually are. And and there was one of your action diagrams that showed the courtyard building, and there were all these interactions in the kind of elevator lobby area. It was planned north, mm -hmm. um, which you know you think about where you'll actually talk to people. It's, it's like one of the other audience members is saying about a non-mandatory activity. It's, it's in a more informal chance encounter situation mm -hmm. as opposed to, I am going to the gym now. And, yes. um, and, and, it's, and it was just striking that, you know, the, in that, and I forget what the other layout, floor layout of the comparison building was, but it was in that one area, the courtyard building, you actually had a bunch of interaction and, and you could imagine coming up with a further plan that had even more kind of sequential or just different spaces for informal interaction. And, but, but then going back to your software, it sounds like a really interesting challenge to capture those different levels of attraction Mm -hmm. in the, the gaming interaction algorithm. Just the last thing I'm trying to bring get to is you think about riding an elevator. You never talk to people in an elevator, partly because there's, you know, even if they're your friend, you're going to be, you don't know who's going to, what stranger is going to show up when yeah. you're all in too small a space. And so everybody's being very careful about their personal boundaries. And I'm just curious, I guess I'm curious to hear how you guys model those different levels of kind of magnetism or attraction? Well, uh, Peter, mostly, mostly right now, it's guesswork fed by uh, research that's mostly done with other areas of focus. It's quite, it's quite funny. Um, but, but in simple terms, the, um, we don't need to know, to get some baseline useful information, we don't need to know everything. Um, and as I say, we're working through this through this this detailed sensitivity testing. But one of the things that I get a um, um, if I'm not answering your question, and you know, please feel free to ask it again in a different way. Uh, but but one of the the things that you're pointing towards is an area of value for the software that we think is interesting. Almost again, irrespective of that ability to have absolute confidence about whether social interactions occur or not, which is kind of which is a simple question where you spend the money. Um, so, for example, one of the one of the buildings we modeled was a was a, a student residence at the University of British Columbia, where we ran into this kind of all these interesting issues of very very high degree of social ability. But leaving aside all of that, what we recognized it was a quite a traditional model of quite a large building with a, a slab building with two two towers at each end, was it just using very simple and defensible assumptions about that you're going to go and eat food three times a day that one stairway was going to be used orders of magnitude more so than the other stairway. And the stairways are actually detailed in the same way. And so for us, we all know this as, as architects and designers, that, that question of like, there's never enough money to make everything perfect. But in simple terms, when you looked at that modeling, you do something really simple. You say this, this one stairway is going to be as cheap as possible because no one's ever going to use it. You know, you don't spend a single dime on that one. And if you want to have some windows and nice chairs, um, and the other one, that's where you do it. 
which is actually a very useful thing to understand and, and doesn't require us to know all of the details about where social interaction occurs, right? It just says we know that, you know, simple terms, we know you're more likely to have a social interaction in a brightly lit stairway with a little bit of extra space where there's views in and out, um, including to other spaces of the building, than you are in a completely enclosed concrete stairway um, with um, with minimal minimal width. So what when, we don't know came, is what how much more likely you are. And that's a very interesting question. When you came up with your model, the first step, uh, first step was to uh, look at and and record existing buildings and their connectivity? Um, I mean, you must no. start somewhere. No. In fact, what, what we did what, is... Do we, you intend to? Yes. So compare, what were the process... Compare yeah, the, the pros built versus... Yeah. Compare the built condition versus what you're modeling. And then following beyond that, what were the draws that made them different? Yes. This is exactly what we're doing right now, um, is that what we're doing is we're identifying pairs of buildings that are architecturally as different as possible, as similar as possible in terms of their population, i.e. it would be completely erroneous to try and compare a student residence to a senior's, senior's residence. And what we're doing is we're gonna model, the, model all the buildings, see what the model predicts, and then we're gonna survey the residents and see what they're comparing. So this is a very simple A-B analysis. And then what our academic partners tell us is that is they think of it in terms of a coin flip. You know, if we do that once and we say, and our model predicts that B, building B is gonna be better than building A um, uh, and the coin flip set, and, and the, the survey says the same thing, that's a single data point. And their magic number is five pairs. If we're able to predict consistently five pairs, it was, so then we know we've got something useful. That doesn't mean that all our inputs are correct. I just want to be really clear about that. And we won't know that for, for um, um, some time. Because, but we're uh, so. But I go back way back to the beginning of the question. What we did when we started actually, we just had a bunch of arguments. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. We sort of like, and what we found, one of the challenges of this work is, is we've all lived in places. So we all carried really strong assumptions about what supports social interaction and what doesn't. Um, and, and we did we did a bunch of uh, kind of test modeling to see what, what, what would understood. And our goal really was to get a really long list of all the factors we think could be important and then start to narrow them down. And we've, we've got very, um, and, and one of the reasons we do these kind of little presentations quite a lot is we actually always learn something. We get a slightly different perspective. Like Catherine's question, for example, about um, should we predict that, that people are actually going to be more social in, uh, let's say, a, a comfortable games room than in the lobby is actually an interesting question. And it may not be important to get that right, but it is a good lens on it. Like in, in, it used to be, I'm sure it's not true anymore, but that in uh, dormitories and in uh, elderly, at least, the mailroom was the, the big draw. Yes. And so that's what got people in high rise um, dormitories, all of those things to, to get onto that elevator and then to have their, their mail and then to ride that elevator back and that prompted conversations in itself. Exactly. But, but I mean, I guess those, I'm wondering what those draws are because, and if you can generically determine those, uh, like the end of the quarter, I mean, that's gonna be a long, that's always gonna be a problem unless the, you know, somehow the quarter doesn't have an end or does it double back on itself or, you know, yeah. that's why, the, that's why the, uh, the U seems better. But the U, do you uh, do you find that the U there are ways that the U can become equally as strong at the ends of it? Um, it's it's a super good question, John. And and the answer is when you no, know, we looked at a whole bunch of case studies, but we haven't yet got to that granular like in this building type, do this and everything gets better. Partially, what we want to do. One of the reasons again we do this work is we'd love you guys to to take 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 it and, you know, plug it into some of your own projects and see what happens and, you know, tell us the bits we've got wrong. Um, uh, but uh, it's, but the example um, of, you know, which, which side of a building should an entry be 
is actually again a very interesting example. But it, you know, it's, it seems to me that you really got to know your program of who you're designing for, and 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 it's going to vary with time. I mean, uh, the internet has totally changed the whole uh, interaction thing. It has. And so, how does that going to affect that? And how can you? fight back on it i mean you know it's like they say libraries are dead well they're not dead no you know people go to go to the libraries all the time they like to be there even without the internet so yeah um well good luck that's great <laughs> i mean uh, i'm anxious to see what your next steps are trying to yeah predict well, uh, there's there's three um um what a great leading question john you guys have good questions i think so <laughs> actually fun i always get the smaller groups you often get better questions i mean rather than big groups but, um so we're doing three one is we're going through this validation process to test existing circumstances to start to understand that we're also looking for for um by doing this kind of sensitivity testing to start to understand which of the aspects of the thing is it really important to get right um and uh, because they really do affect it, um, because and some of that means letting go of things we really want to think are important, but uh, but may not be so important. Um, and then we're also we're we've decided that one of the one of the ways to kind of get this work out more effectively is to start a little nonprofit focused on this issue. Um, in part, um, there's a series we have a series of, of of collaborators doing looking at sociability in this region and, and understanding it. And we just want like, you know, we want this to be our gift. We, we're, we love to be thought leaders in the whole issue of, of evidence-based sociability, but we really want other people to be digging in and, and, and asking exactly the same kind of questions because we certainly won't be able to answer them all, nor should we try to. I have one more question. You said that you, uh, you, you have chosen to stay inside a, a building. <laughs> and you don't, you don't want to involve yourself outside of that building. And I can I understand to limit the, you know, you got to limit it somewhere. Yeah. Limit the variables. But have you learned things from inside that are applicable? Do you think to streets? Yes. Like, yeah. I, like I sort of know that one sided streets don't work as well. I mean, you know, particularly if they're commercial. Uh, absolutely. And we do believe that the, the, the greatest potential for this actually might be in urban design. Um, yeah, we just wanted to be. Yeah, we just wanted to be a little bit cautious and modest. One, because a couple of things happened. One was, um, it is as I say, it, it's kind of cloud computing heavy, and and we wanted to really make sure that we had that within the slightly more constrained area of a building that we were doing that we were taking the right steps to get it right, rather than immediately say, oh, this is great, let's just expand it to the you know to the city scale, um, and we also you know there there. We, we know we can crack the just the density problem by um, a, a computing process where you just kind of silo so that the, it's not like the simulation starts at A and goes at B. It's actually occurring simultaneously in a bunch of different locations. That's technically complex, but very doable. But the other thing we, we really need to make sure we understand is what's what are our root finding choices and to make sure that 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 we're actually um, doing it right. But we do believe we're, in saying that we are starting with buildings, we, we do think it's got, gonna have great potential in urban design. We're just not there yet. And we also wanna, um, we would rather under promise and over deliver than pretend that we know everything. Will you eventually get to use doing uh, community and privacy as part of, or you do that automatically now or not? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what the question means. Okay. So. You know, some architects from California got involved heavily in back in the '70s doing for defensible spaces. Oh well, one of the one of the applications that we think is. Do you guys do the do you use the term septed crime prevention through entire septed crime prevention through entire and no. Oh, it's a it's a Canadian term then. It's cancer crime prevention through environmental design. It is one of the things that we can start to analyze simply like what areas of, again, just using simple root finding algorithms, what areas of a building are likely to be, you know, let's say nobody's ever gonna go there, which is usually not a good thing, right? You know, that sort of stuff. So we think there's lots of potential for kind of additional additional plugins using the data we're able to generate. So there's safety in numbers in your mind. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Bruce, can you share a little bit how can we access the software and is it it's fully oh, free? Sure. And it's... Let me, um, uh, yeah, thank you, Felipe. I appreciate that. Let me just start. Right. I'm going to do. Uh, 
Uh, I'm gonna put a link in here. And, and essentially our, our, our goal, um, uh, we have a, we, we use a subscription model that that'll give you the, um, but again, our goal is, and our agreement with our funders is very straightforward and we totally yeah. support it is we don't, we don't make any profit on it. We just need to actually pay for the cloud computing. That's actually the only, the only cost that we, uh, we download onto the users. And again, it's, uh, um, uh, we're, we're trying to, uh, trying to get to Google or Amazon or somebody else to just donate some to us. We haven't been successful in that as yet. Okay. Great, thank you. And non-Revit users that are using BIM from other software. Uh, we would love to be able to do that. We haven't done that yet. What we've had, we've had, we've done a couple of test runs, and I don't want to oversee the value of this, where where you're um, exporting it to to Revit. So I personally don't use Revit myself. We would like to see if we could do, say, a SketchUp one, which is the other common one. We yeah, just it's probably very to simple kind of, too. Yeah, it might, it might become a simpler one, and maybe it might lighter a simpler on computing. One, yeah. And we did we did look at we we had a bunch of choices around that one. None of which I would say were actually perfect. And we decided okay. to go with Revit just because, in our experience, it was the most common platform. Well, it is. Yeah. That had, well, that also had the ability to be intelligent enough that we could do the tagging system. So. It's not you, a perfect choice. It's not my favorite program at all, by the way, but it's kind of like- one Probably of had some things. examples that you got for free too, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you got the drawings for free, right? That you-, you Exactly, work. yes. No, we, we can okay. we get those. So if we download the software and we start playing around with it, like uh, we, I have somebody here in my office who was very intrigued and had questions and I'm surprised Christian was not here because I told him, I mean, you can ask the questions regarding who do we, how, how do we communicate? How, what so is the best a, way a, to communicate feedback, ask questions? Yeah, the, the best way is through the Fluid Circle site. You just join it up and we put uh, put questions questions at, uh, at there and we try to respond to them. And it's also, again, okay. it's, it's, it's helpful for us as well because then we have a single go-to go, oh, did we fix that yet or something like okay. that. And okay. just so you know, you don't actually have to download the software. It's simply, it's kind of a, because it's software as a service model that kind of lives sure. on the web. Um, um, so, and we, the reason we did that is we just didn't want to get caught in this game where as soon as uh, um, anybody comes out with a new version of something, a new operating system, we have to suddenly scramble because sure. we just don't have sure. the resources to do that. Um, Philippe, it sounds like that's it for questions. Um, yeah. Do you have anything for us, uh, Bruce? No, I I'm last just, last words. Yeah. I, I'm I'm just uh, I'm I'm grateful. At what I what I said is that that this this for us is a real learning process. I I'm, I appreciate your questions because um, it's been it's been really fun to challenge ourselves to to learn. And I would say the other, um, maybe on a last other use that, that I know it's not the focus of this particular group, but one of the funny stories about this for us is that we also believe that social interaction, and this is well known, is also valuable in kind of office and, and university environments, right. simply because ideas occur. And one of the funniest things about this process was that one of the ways we ended up with our software builder, because we're not software builders, we put out a proposal call for it, was that a guy who we rented some space with in our office heard me talking about it and said, oh, I've got some friends that I probably think could help with this. And they've been amazing partners. And I would say actually that both the fact that that initial link occurred, occurred totally because of physical mm. social interaction, mm. but it also meant that they were more committed to the project and they've been really lovely partners. So That's I think correct. that the value of this stuff is often surprising. And I know we all, I'll spend time in the in the Zoom world, and there's nothing wrong with the Zoom world, but I'm still a huge believer in that process. Yeah, absolutely. How do you how does get the info? What's uh, Elizabeth Dunn? You said she's written quite a bit. Yeah, she's got a couple of great TED talks um, as well, and she hasn't written very much on this this focus. But the academics are excited about it because it is this whole issue of what I, we call the physicality of sociability is so underbaked. Um, so she's excited and she's got a couple of, she actually focuses on, um, some of her focus historically has been on money, for example, identifying that people are happier if they give their money away rather than keep it. Um, 
uh, she's a uh, uh, she's just great. She's she's a she's a fabulous academic and a really lovely person. So um, I can't sing Liz's praises long enough. So it's really worth just ch checking out her TED talks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. This is have awesome. a great evening, everybody. Thank yeah, you, you, everybody. You mentioned nice you. Uh, we can we have to get our uh, credits. How do we do that? Yes. If anyone, I will post a form right now again in the chat. Please log in and. Uh, add your AIA number to the to the Google form. Okay, thank you. Did you get it? Just before I, I close, I don't think I did. No. Okay, so yeah. if you go down in the chat, yeah. there is a message with a the message before last. Okay, let me see there. Go there. No, I didn't get it. I'm sorry. Hmm. Have you, you clicked on the chat down at the bottom of your screen? Okay, here we go. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. It's a form. Okay, very good. Thank you. you. Thanks. Click or save the chat, otherwise it's gone. Yeah. Save the chat, you say? Yeah. You, you, you see the three little dots? If you click on the three little dots, you can save the chat. The yes. entire. Where are the three little dots? Right at the bottom of the chat window, to the uh, bottom right. I don't see those. Low, low, low at the bottom, where where you have the um, space to type in. Right yeah, to the right of it, are little dots. I, I don't have a place to. If to if you got the link. If you got the link, it's okay. You can you can put in your uh, credentials right there at the link. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks everybody. Bye. Bye. Have a good night. Bye.